What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, let's jump in. Happy Saturday everybody, I hope you're all having a wonderful weekend. Let's jump in first with the Evergrande housing crisis. We've seen a lot of information coming out about the Chinese property market and housing crisis from the last 24 to 36 hours. So let's try and wade into some of this and see what we can glean from it. Uh, domestic financial media outlet, the 21st Century Business Herald, has learned that China will allow property firms to further access more funds and escrow from pre-sale after certain conditions are met. According to the new guidelines, which have not been made public yet, quote, the leftover funds after regulatory quotas have been met can be used by property firms, end quote. The newspaper, in the careful manner by which domestic non-state publications need to write, expressed that after the Evergrande crisis blew up last year, some local governments were too extreme in their knee-jerk reactions and quote-unquote excessively regulated pre-sale funds in escrow, and that quote, the above-mentioned document will seek to correct such behavior and will help some cash-strapped firms to ease their cash conditions. End quote. Bloomberg reports yesterday that China's biggest bond debt managers are moving to support cash-strapped real estate developers at the urging of policymakers in Beijing, adding to official efforts to contain the outbreak from a string of defaults. Quote, Regulators have told state-owned firms, including China Huarong Asset Management Co. and China Cinder Asset Management Co., to participate in the restructuring of weak developers, acquire stalled property projects, and buy soured loans, end quote. And according to state-run financial publication Securities Daily, in recent months, some Chinese property firms have been, quote, scrambling to find buyers of their assets amid a concerted effort by regulators to contain risks in the real estate sector, end quote. In this environment, state-owned firms have formed acquisition lists for, quote-unquote, core commercial properties in first-tier and second-tier cities. So expect a string of of purchases of assets from private developers into the hands of state-owned enterprises. Moving on, this week the US Department of Commerce listed 33 Chinese entities it said use American export items in ways that it has been unable to trace. While firms on the list are still able to do business in the United States, they may need additional licenses to buy products from U.S. entities. Chinese novel drug maker, or C Biologics Cayman Inc., is one of the most high profile among the listed companies. The U.S. Department of Commerce announcement caused shares of the firm to tank as much as 32% in Hong Kong on the following trade day, and the Chinese Security Index Healthcare Index dropped as much as 2.6% to its lowest level in almost two years. Other additions to the list included Guangdong, Guanghua Science Tech Co. Limited, and Zhuzhou CRRC Special Equipment Technology Co. Limited. Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin reports yesterday that deliveries of China's homegrown C919 narrow body passenger jet are expected in 2022. Quote, after several delays, despite a tight schedule for regulatory certifications and uncertainties related to US trade bans. End quote. Tsai Xin explains that Commercial Aircraft Corp of China, COMAC, initially planned to deliver the C919 in 2017, but the schedule was repeatedly delayed because of technology and supply issues. The C919 made its first test flight in May of 2017, with six prototype airplanes operating in different regions across the country. Regulatory reviews for its airworthiness certification started in December of 2020. COMAC has received more than 800 provisional orders for the C919, mostly from domestic airlines or leasing firms. The technology confrontation between China and the United States is also a factor for COMAC. According to the article, and based on findings in a report by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a Washington-based think tank, about 60% of the main suppliers to the C919 are American companies, such as General Electric, Honeywell, and Eaton Corp. Now, while we are on US-China developments, let's move into ideology and narratives. 
But quickly, uh, as always, thank you everyone for listening to the video. If you're enjoying the content, don't forget to uh, hit the like button. It's a huge help for a small channel like this. And if you're watching for the first time and getting some value from this analysis, maybe consider subscribing. Okay, let's move on. Yesterday, we discussed a commentary in the state-run People's Daily about the superiority of the Chinese system. This is according to the state-run People's Daily. The day after that article, state-run Xinhua published another piece discussing the inferiority of the US system, seen by Beijing as an ideological competitor. Just like yesterday, let us look at some of this commentary, which again, like yesterday, speaks for itself, to get a sense of how Beijing is presenting this competition of government systems to a domestic and increasingly international audience. It is up to the United States to improve its own competitiveness, but US politicians are instead containing and suppressing China's innovation and development once again exposing the U.S. side's hegemonic nature and domineering ways. In recent years, U.S. politicians have smeared China's image by any means, spared no effort to block Chinese high-tech enterprises, and pulled together small groups in an attempt to hinder China's development. The ugly face of modern pirates has long been known to the world. The U.S. side's ugly acts of wantonly suppressing other countries and undermining peace and stability for its own selfish interests is unpopular around the world. Today, some U.S. politicians continue to disregard the overall situation of China-U.S. relations, and step by step, they are trying to solidify their false claims of suppressing China in the form of laws, trying to lead China-U.S. relations onto the wrong path of conflict and confrontation. The world's educated people should work together to prevent despicableness from becoming a passport for the detestable. All kinds of American diseases expose the deep-seated drawbacks of the American national governance system, which can only be solved by improving the governance capacity of the United States itself. It's time for American politicians to wake up. The enemy of the United States is not China, but itself. If they try to suppress China, they will only end up being the yarn weaver, twisting and braiding a rope around his own neck. You reap what you sow. End quote. Like I said, the peace speaks for itself. And last up, China's education crackdown, round two. Last year, we covered Beijing's private education crackdown and the devastating effect it had on the education sector in the country, particularly in major tier one cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Just to remind ourselves, Beijing banned for-profit tutoring for core curriculum subjects, as well as uh, these sort of subjects and private tutoring on weekends and holidays in July of last year. Over the last few months, local governments in China have rolled out various new measures to stamp out so-called illegal student tutoring, including, incredibly, offering a more than $1,500 US dollar reward for those who report such activities. Now, there is increasing evidence that round two may be on the way for the industry. In late January, a Bloomberg Intelligence Index of Chinese education firms plunged 27% over a three-day period, the steepest loss since the crackdown back in July, with the gauge now at its lowest level since 2015. One major player, China Education Group Holdings Limited, saw a 54% drop in stock value in a week. Analysts with the Intelligence Index reports that the route was triggered by an unverified document from the Ministry of Education in Beijing. Citigroup Inc. analysts wrote in a separate research note that the document included a potential ban on the variable interest entity structure used by Chinese education companies to list abroad, as well as restrictions on their school assets, mergers and acquisition expansion, and tuition fee increases. The document still has yet to be confirmed, but shell-shocked investors evidently are not taking any risks. Hey guys, I'd love to hear what you thought about some of the updates we covered in today's episode, so throw your comments below. Always love hearing from you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.